there's a, there's a line in the epistle lesson, 1 Corinthians, and it seems to me it defines the task, the task of what my responsibility is to you. It's not a small one. It says this, Paul, in the Corinthian lesson that we read this morning, says this. Now, we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God, so that we may understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. In other words, the assumption of the passage is, if you're a Christian, if you've committed your life to Jesus Christ, if you've come into the waters of baptism, if you've said yes to him, God, by his Holy Spirit, has put something brand new in your heart. It's his nature. It's literally the gift of himself. It is the light that Matthew speaks of when, he, when Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Gosh, how is that even possible? It's because of what God has put in us. So, that's in you. Do most of us actually live into much of that? Actually, not really. We look like pretty normal human beings, messing up most of the time, but occasionally coming to God and asking forgiveness, when it, but only when it gets so obvious we don't have any other place to turn. In other words, when we get caught, right? <laughs> we, can, we think we're doing pretty well if we can sort of do it and not get caught, and then nobody's going to notice, not even God. Wrong. It's one of the lies we tell ourselves. So what the scripture is saying is, is that we've received something, and it's precious, and it's wonderful. It's the gifts that God has given us. But we need God to help us by the very spirit that he's put in us to understand what it is that we, in fact, have received. Because we're just regular people in so many ways. We, we don't know all of what God has put in us. Does that make sense? Not your head, if it does. <laughs> so that's what I want us to pray. Because you see, my job, as it were, as a preacher, is to try to communicate particularly in the context of these lessons, something of what God has given us so that we may understand and as a result, be able to act on what it is that we understand. So it's not merely an issue of comprehension because if we actually understand rightly what it is that we have received, we can't help. We can't help but not act on what it is that he has given us. So, if you want your life to be just like it is right now, you may want to check out for a little while. Because my hope, brothers and sisters, is that somehow, in the midst of this, for God to do something that there's no way I could ever do. In other words, this isn't about me manipulating you into something. That's, that's cultish behavior. We don't do that. But instead, that somehow God might reveal something to us that causes us to see ourselves differently. And as a result of seeing ourselves differently, perhaps we might act in a new kind of way. Okay? So if you're in on this, we're good. that's what I'm going to pray for. So let us pray together. Lord, we thank you that we can come to you and ask for that which only you can give. For, Lord, only you can supernaturally reveal things to us that without your revelation we would never know. But that's exactly, Lord, what we need. We need you to come. We need you to come and reveal truth, even as you have promised. Because I confess to you, Lord, that without your help, I do not have the words to communicate. And we confess to you, O Lord, that unless you give us ears to hear, we will not receive. So we ask that you would speak, Lord, and that you would give us the capacity to receive that which you are trying to say, what you are saying through your word. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Okay, two things I want to talk about. One has to do with what it is that we receive. Secondly, the impediment that all of us wrestle with, because we're human beings, that make it difficult for us to live out of what it is that we've received. But if we do, what does that actually look like in terms of living it out? You see, this is epiphany. You know, that's the season we're in. 
Epiphany means manifestation. In other words, God revealing himself. There is a missionary aspect to Epiphany. It isn't just we're giving thanks for God revealing himself to us. If you read the Gospels all through the season of Epiphany, it has a lot to do to talk about in terms of what we're called to reveal because Jesus has revealed himself to us. In other words, there's a missionary aspect to every single one of these lessons, which is why today Jesus has the audacity to say to normal human beings like us, you're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. I don't know about you, but that is not how I've often thought of myself. The light of the world? I, I do pretty well to keep my life straight. And I'm not sure I do that particularly well. So what is this about being light of the world? Or salt of the earth? In other words, the very thing that keeps the work of God preserved, the very thing that causes other people to literally be thirsty for God? Be? Uh, you need to talk to somebody else about that. I, I'd just be really happy if my day goes okay. See, that's, that's the level at which I think most of us live. The, way, the level at which most of us live is we want to make sure that we return phone calls. We want to make sure that we want to answer emails. We want sure we want to get in touch with people, especially our friends. We want to make sure that we can pay the bills. We, can want, to, we want to make sure that the people around us are going to be okay. And, and, and that's pretty much for many of us the scope of our concern. Jesus has a different scope. He has a very, very different focus. And it's not that he's not concerned about those things. Actually, he is. In fact, the wonderful mystery of the entire Sermon on the Mount, out of which the Matthew lesson is taken, is that he even says the kind of stunning things that the God of the universe that literally called planets into being actually num knows the very number of the hairs on your head. I, do you understand that? I know, especially since the fact that since some, some of us are losing ours, he has to keep track. <laughs> but that's the level of God's concern. Not just his concern as sitting up there on some heavenly throne, observing, oh, he lost about 20 years today. But instead, he's actually intimately and personally involved with us. The very nature of what it means to belong to Jesus is that we belong. To Jesus, that means he is with us. I will never leave you or forsake you. Nothing can take you out of my hand. In other words, the glory of a part of what it means to be a believer in Christ is that we literally walk in the companionship of his presence. No matter where we are, no matter where we've been, no matter where we're going, there is no place on planet Earth there is no place in the human psyche where God is absent. No matter how wonderful or no matter how dark. What does the psalmist say? Even if I make my bed in hell, you are there. So that no matter what hellish things you may know of, either in here or in your circumstances, there is no place where God is not. And the invitation of what it means to be a believer in Jesus is the fact that there is someone, not just something, there is someone who is full of power and great right, literally living inside of us at the very core of our being. That there is supernatural, God-given provision in every single situation. Because why? He, right here, He is here. He is here. I want you to know, if I didn't believe that with every fiber of my being, and I do, there's no way I could do what I'm doing. It's just impossible. I mean, I was, Jim and I were talking before the service, and he, we were just chatting, and he said, I'm so glad I don't have your job. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the point. It doesn't mean that I have the answer to fix everything. I don't. But I know how to count on 
a supernatural provision that can make a difference that I can never make. And when I walk into a situation, when you, if you're a Christian, walk into a situation, it is that supernatural difference that literally comes with you. Unbidden. Because it's already there. You don't need to ask God to show up. Literally, if you're in Him and you walk in, God's shown up. Most of us don't think that way. See, we have this crazy idea that what's really going on is, is that God shows up if I'm good. If I do okay. If I haven't messed up recently. Then maybe He'll pay attention to my prayer. And then maybe something will happen that couldn't have happened if I hadn't have prayed. But we live in this life where there's like a ledger. And if the good outweighs the bad, then maybe I'm going to be okay and maybe God will answer. But if the ledger goes the other way, then no matter what I try, I might as well give up because God's not interested in me at all. You know, that's great deism. God helps those who help themselves. Benjamin Franklin and all that. It's dreadful Christianity. It's just not in the Bible. Just the opposite. I mean, think about this. Jesus speaking to a bunch of ordinary people in the Sermon on the Mount. And who were the ones that were interested? The outcasts, the prostitutes, the people who didn't fit in. Those who knew that they weren't acceptable according to those scribes and the Pharisees. In fact, that's what Jesus is getting after when he says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, what is he talking about? Is he trying to set a standard that's just impossible? No, 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 no. You see, the scribes and the Pharisees were very clear about the fact if you did these things, God would accept you. If you didn't do them, you were just out. Jesus came to say, that's not the kind of righteousness I'm talking about. I'm talking about something that invites, no matter who you are, just as you are, you can come into the presence of God. You can be accepted as his child. You can be received as his own. You can be made new in a way that can never, ever happen except that he do it, being born again. And none of that, absolutely none of that, has to do with any sense of whether you qualify or not. See, the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees says you have to qualify for God to pay attention. Jesus says, no, that's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm speaking to you people, Jesus is saying. You are. Not if you work hard, you will become the light of the world. No, you are because of what I put inside of you. So that literally, no matter who you are, there's, the ledger's gone. Do you hear that? The ledger is gone. That's what forgiveness is. That's why when we do the confession and Jim or I or any of the other clergy stand up and say, Almighty God, have mercy on you. Do you know there are no qualifications on that? Yeah, yeah, you qualify, so God will listen to your prayer. But you haven't, you're not really sorry, are you? So I'm not going to listen to you. That doesn't happen. Do you see that? We, we still have this idea of justice that limits our capacity to receive because we do not believe that we qualify. And so long as we live there, we will never, ever even begin to enjoy the salt light calling that is, in fact, ours to receive. Because we'll always be hedging our bets. It's a very human way of thinking. But Paul's so clear, that's not the Spirit of God. We have a different kind of wisdom that the world does not understand. What do you think he needs? What he's talking about is mercy that is wider than anything you and I have ever done. And therefore, he says, based on that mercy, Jesus says, see, all the lessons really go together. You're the light of the world. You see, if I begin to know that God has put something supernatural in me, that he's with me no matter where I am, no matter where I go, no matter what I do, that that means I can be available for him to use me in the most unexpected places. And that God, in fact, cares, cares deeply about that light coming into the places where I don't expect, where I work, a restaurant, a club I might go to. What's happening when I'm sitting around playing cards with my friends? 
God is just as interested, in fact, I often think more so than he is in terms of what we do here. I mean, God likes it to go, look nice and go well. What does it say in Corinthians? God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. So order, it's a good thing. But what God is more interested in than even well-ordered liturgy is a human heart that is open to him and knows that that heart always finds whatever that heart needs in the presence of God. That means so much more to him than whether or not the procession looks right. That's the Isaiah lesson, you see. The whole Isaiah diatribe has to do with, you know, you think if you do it well when you gather together and worship, I'm not going to care about the other stuff. Boy, are you so wrong. Is this not the fast that I have chosen for you? To lose the hand of wickedness. In other words, to literally find a way to be his light in the business world, in the social world, among your friends. No more this sort of secular, sacred divide so I can be religious on Sundays and then live like hell the rest of the week. That's not it. See? No, no, no. Christianity heals that place of brokenness and says wherever you are, wherever you are, you're on God's planet. And that who are you on God's planet? You are His. Therefore, be His wherever you are. Live into the vocation of what you've received. The light of Christ is in you, and therefore you can, in fact, make a difference where you are so that you can, with God's authority, real authority, say, Lord, there's a business thing and I don't even know how to get at it. It's, it all looks unethical to me and I don't know what to do. What to do. There's wisdom for that. In the midst of a family situation that seems broken. I don't know what to do, God. These kids are entirely out of my control. Or I don't know what my brother-in-law is going to do next. It doesn't matter, you see. God loves them just as much as he <coughs> And he will show you. He will show you. How to live in the midst of those kinds of very human, broken situations that all of us live and know. None of us are exempt from any of that, right? All of us have bizarre relatives. In fact, in some cases, we're the bizarre relative. <laughs> all of us have things that have happened in our lives that we wish we didn't have happened. Places of shame and guilt that we just try to act like they're not there. All of that's what we are. Jesus says that in the midst of that, there is a place where you can be clean. Where you can know his mercy. And wherever you are, you can walk in that kind of light. That's the message. That's the message. That's the liberty of that abundant life, which is the quote from the collect for this morning, that we have, in fact, been given. These who are coming to be confirmed, received, reaffirmed, are saying, in essence, I'm willing to count on that. That's what they're saying yes to. So that wherever they are, wherever they go, I've been marked. I belong to him. And I want to be God's man. I want to be God's woman. I want to be his child wherever I am. No more divided living. You're also going to be making similar commitments. I would invite you to ask Jesus to help you in that commitment to heal that divide that, as Solzhenitsyn says, runs straight through the human heart. So that you and I might know wherever we are that he will never let us go and that we are his. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, thank you that you are so real that we can trust you with all of the realities that we know good and bad, that nothing is hidden from you, and that there is mercy and grace, forgiveness and power for all that we face, all that we see, and all that we know. So we thank you this morning, Lord, that we can come to you as we are, and that you receive us. You throw your arms around us. You welcome us home. 
Thank you for welcoming us home. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen.